Good morning, TV Toastmasters. Yay! <clears throat> a small, small oil group, but we're uh, we're going to continue on, and we're going to tread on and and have a meeting anyway. Um, so, I just wanted to uh, congratulate um, the club for being a distinguished club last year, and Michelle, I think uh, that's part of your leadership. Thank you for that. With, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our Toastmaster for today, Rick Barron. Thank you, Rick. If we had a few more Ricks, we could make it the Rick Show, but sorry, that's it. There's only two of us today for the Rick Show. As Toastmaster, my role is to facilitate the transitions between the phases of the meeting that we have. We have an impromptu speaking portion of our meeting. We have prepared speeches. And we have an evaluation portion at the meeting of the meeting at the end. But before we get into that, we have someone who's going to come up and provide us a challenging word that we must use every time we come up here. And she will also serve as our grammarian and our awe counter that we'll come back and touch base with her at the end of the meeting, Michelle Lewis. The Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters. As Rick mentioned, as the grammarian, my job is to make my fellow Toastmasters aware of the use and misuse of their gram gr the grammar, American English and language. And I'm also supposed to keep track of the use of the word of the day. And I encourage everyone to use the word of the day. And today's word is tact. Put this up here as a reminder. And tact is a noun. It's the ability to avoid giving offense, skill in situations in which other people's feelings have to be considered. The peace talks required great tact on the part of both leaders. Tact can also be used in an adjective form, that's the word tactful, and also as an adverb, tactfully, and another noun, tactfulness. So please use the word of the day, tact, and also be aware of how you're using the grammar. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We now transition to our impromptu speaking portion of the meeting. This is where we have an opportunity to think on our feet with a question posed by our table topics master, Paul Wessels. Thank you, Rick. Thinking on your feet, trying to say something when you're not prepared. It's something we do every day, something we need practice uh, doing. And here at Toastmasters, we try to uh, do that each meeting. And one of the purposes is to get everybody involved in, in the meeting. We've got a small crowd today, so we're going to have to do a little bit of double duty uh, with the word of the day. Word of the day, usually you try to go one or two minutes uh, once you're given the question. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and start with the question. Basically, it's a shorter version of the speech that you would give in a typical Toastmasters uh, meeting. So my first question, in your opinion, what is the most valuable man-made invention and why? In your opinion, what is the most valuable man-made invention and why? Dalip, can I get you from the camera? get down here. Thank you. Philippe? Greatest man-made invention. I think it has to be the paper clip. <laughs> the paper clip. I mean, people talk about bread and, you know, sliced bread and uh, medicine and others. I think it's the paper clip. I mean, look at the amount of papers on my desk, and if I didn't have a paper clip, oh my God. <laughs> It used to be very monotonous, stainless steel paper clips which were boring for a number of years. Now my children show me colored paper clips. I said, wow, this is good. Now it, I can relate this to M&Ms. <laughs> multiple colors, multiple designs. So paper clips, I think, is the most uh, creative and the most innovative inno um, deta you know, innovation of all times. What are the uses of paper clips? I can put them together. To, on my currency notes and hold them as a paper clip, like a true paper clip. 
I can, sometimes I've even used it against my tie. When I see my tie not working properly, I use a pin. And people think, oh, that's new fashion. I said, yes, I create fashion. <laughs> there are other uses of paper clip. Some of them uh, probably I don't want to say here. <laughs> but I've, you know, sometimes you see one of the buttons come off or one of the, um, you know, zipper areas come off, and I say, you know what, paper clips could be a good thing to use there in emergencies. <laughs> so think about this. I mean, you're all laughing, but I know you've used paper clips in more than one ways. That's the reason it's the most innovative, most creative invention ever. Slice bread, take this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I always take paper clip apart. I don't know. I use it for digging something out or trying to repair something. So I, I use paper clips a lot. So Dilip, thank you. That was a very tactful uh, presentation and impromptu speech. Our next question, let me pick one here. The next question is, what was the highlight of your day yesterday? So think of yesterday, which was Friday. What was the highlight of your day. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Table Topic mm -hmm. The highlight of my day yesterday. They say a bad day on the golf course is better than a good day at work. Mm. I got to play 18 holes of golf yesterday in a company sponsored scramble. Now, I don't call myself an avid golfer. I would say I dabble. If I make contact, that's good. <laughs> Not going to be winning any trophies, any awards, but playing golf can be fun. It can be frustrating for those of you who have gone out there. It looks like an easy sport for someone who's never gone out there and tried to play. Hitting a ball with a stick, how tough can that be? The ball's not even moving. It's not like baseball. But it is a truly challenging sport. But the highlight of my day was, even though it rained, and even though I lost probably close to a dozen balls, the highlight of my day was spending my Friday afternoon on the golf course. Mr. Table Topics Master. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. We'll do one more question here. Let's pick one, a good one. Let's pick a e nice, easy question. What was the house like? Please describe the house that you grew up in. Just give us a little one to two minute interpretation and some feelings and, and, and de description of the house that you grew up in. Carol? Can you come up here and describe the house that you grew up in? Absolutely. Carol? <laughs> the house of my dreams. Oh, <laughs> can that. Growing up, I moved to the house that I lived in until I got married when I was five years old. And I got married when I was 23, so for 18 years. I lived in a white farmhouse on 28 acres of ground. We had a small farm. The farmhouse, my daddy was a, in construction, and he had rebuilt from a wire factory. Moved it on our lot and rebuilt it. We had, I don't know how many bedrooms. We had five bedrooms upstairs and one downstairs. And we, it was a 10-room house and added on to that. But it was a place where people would gather. It was a loving home. And even though I was poor when I was young, didn't know it. We always had food to eat. We always had clothing. My mother made clothes for me out of feed sacks. And I was proud that my mother made my dresses. I'd be left out of school today wearing a feed sack to school. <laughs> but it was, it was a, a spacious home. And my daddy had used knotty pine in the living room and the dining room. So it was all... Naughty Pine, both of those rooms, very warm, friendly. And he did something unusual. He outlined the ceiling with Celotex. 
and it had rope around that. So it was quite unusual. We had chimes that had the big chimes hanging down in the living room. And it, it was a warm, friendly home, and anyone was welcome there when we had gatherings. We'd have 40, 50 people for Thanksgiving, Christmas. And if you were in college and your roommate didn't have any place to go, you could bring them home. And I can remember that one gal my niece had brought home, she said, I've never seen so many short people that didn't drink. <laughs> so it was a loving home, and it was a place that when I moved, I moved into the smallest home that anyone in my family owned. And I still live there to this day, 57 years later. So I, I think you need to plant roots and <laughs> live. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I can kind of relate to that because I still live, and this is kind of unique, uh, in the house I grew up in. I actually moved away for a while, uh, lived in Detroit and Houston, but uh, parents were selling their house, nobody wanted it, and I actually live in the house that I grew up in, so that's kind of unique. Thank you everyone for the tactful, uh, informative, impromptu speeches, and I will now turn the meeting over to Rick Barron, our Toastmaster. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. Great tactfulness in which the people responded to those impromptu questions. I like that. We now transition to the prepared speaking portion of our meeting. And here's where members of the club have chosen a product, a product, chose a, to, chose a project, researched what it is that the objectives are, created a speech, and come here to deliver it for us. We have two prepared speeches today, and we're going to have kind of both ends of the spectrum. First speech, and a distinguished Toastmaster who's working from one of the advanced manuals. So this has an opportunity to show us the great growth that occurs in people, or what we get to see is we get to see how good people come to us and they just come to get better. So we get to see that in the evaluation portion. Our first speaker is Patty Raggetts. Patty comes to us. She was inspired by a previous member who is now no longer with us. <laughs> Shankar moved off to Chicago and left Patty behind. We will take her. Thank you very much, Shankar. We're glad that you brought Patty to us. This is her icebreaker speech, so her very first prepared speech that she's providing for us. Out of the Competent Communication Manual, her speech title is Courageous Journey. Courageous Journey, Patty Raggett. Have you ever been called stupid? I have. It takes a tremendous amount of courage to build confidence in yourself. Stand strong on who you really know you are inside. After a meeting with a counselor at Anderson High School says to you, Patty, you're too stupid to go to college. Wow, talk about stabbing you right in the gut of your soul. Such a strong word. Could there have been a more tactful way to deliver that message? Back then, that is the language they used. You were labeled for everything. Now what do I do? I have my heart set on... Miami University, where my sisters went to college, realizing that that dream was not going to happen. The core belief of being called stupid stayed with me for over 20 years. After years of painful therapy, I met a life coach who's, excuse me, 
I met a life coach who said, let's take an ax to that belief and let's get a cinder block, paint believe on it. It was like a firework lit up inside me. She helped me believe that if I was willing to change my belief and to believe that anything is possible, which led to meeting healers who help heal wounds that have occurred in your life. Though I vowed if I ever heard this happen to anyone, I would be the voice to help. A boy who lives in my neighborhood was walking home from school one day. He stopped at my mailbox where I was standing. I said, how was your day? He said, awful. My teacher told my entire classroom we were a bunch of stupid idiots, that we would never amount to anything. I told him it was not true, not to believe it. that only you know the truth about yourself. I deliberated on it, what to do, and I took it upon myself to call the superintendent of Forest Hill Schools, Dr. Patswald. He was very upset about hearing the news. He told me he would follow up. A week later, he gave me a call and said, I had the teacher apologize to the class and she, she was reprimanded for it. Dr. Patswald goes to my gym. One day after his tennis match, I had the courage to go up to him and introduce myself. He looked at me and said, Patty, you changed an entire classroom that day by letting me know what happened. Now a few years have passed since then and a lot of inner coal soul work to find my purpose led me to my seminars called Stuff Hindering Inner Truth, better known as Shed the Shit. <laughs> it teaches people to believe in themselves and to find their purpose. Shortly before my second seminar, I ran into Dr. Patswold. He asked me, how are you? I said, I'm great. I reached into my purse. I gave him a flyer on my seminar. He looked at it, looked me straight in the face and said, Patty, you have a purpose now. Go do it. Sometimes it takes another person to encourage you to see your truth. May you go forth with courage to know who you are. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Wow. Absolutely incredible icebreaker. We'll be right back after this message from Toastmasters. Name an effective political leader in history who couldn't speak well. There aren't any. Because when it comes to a disease, freedom like requires leadership, and leadership, leadership requires parties. oratory. You have to speak to be heard. I have a dream. It's all about personal growth and guts. Never give in. Never, never, never. Hi, I'm Rick Davis, and this is my editorial, Stop the Insanity. Twice a year, insanity reigns throughout the world. In March, the world springs forward, and in November, the world falls back, at least in the Western Hemisphere. Daylight savings time. <laughs> Do people really believe that changing a clock changes the sun? The sun still rises and sets at the same time. Meanwhile, schedules change. We trudge off to work earlier in the spring and later in the fall. We go to bed earlier in the spring and later in the fall. What is the harm? Generally, most clocks need to be changed. 
These can be everything from antique clocks sitting out on the square to computer operating systems. Some of these are automatic, but many are not. Who has not overslept at least one time when a vital clock did not get reset? But the clock I'm most concerned about is our internal clock. Our bodies respond to circadian rhythms. Circadian means about a day. There are people who can change their, in clock, their internal clock very easily. They don't suffer from jet lag when they fly from one coast to the other. But most people do experience jet lag, and a, this is a mismatch between solar time, the, the time the sun is showing us, and the person's internal clock. Twice a year, in effect, we jump a time zone, and there can be negative consequences. Researchers from San Jose State University found that accident rates in California significantly increase the week after daylight savings time change. Sam Schultz, the former New York City traffic commissioner, says, when I was traffic commissioner, I always noticed a surge in crashes the week after daylight savings time. He cited a 1998 research uh, pr uh, report from the University of British Columbia who showed a 17% spike in accidents the week after daylight savings time was incorporated. The same group showed a 9% increase in the 1990s. Near misses become crashes due to less than one hour of sleep. But wait, there are countries that have never had daylight savings time. There are, there are states in the United States don't, that don't even mess with their clocks. This map shows the countries that have never had daylight savings time in red, mainly in Africa. Uh, states that have given up daylight savings time in orange, uh, states and, and countries, notice that Arizona and the United States and Hawaii never change their clocks. And in my opinion, the changing of our clocks is a scam. I have no problem with us staying on standard time or staying on daylight time, but leave the clocks alone. <laughs> I hear the morning people, oh, I so love daylight savings time because the mornings are so bright and cheery. I like my afternoons and sunlight. My suggestion is that employers give workers the option of coming to work an hour early during the summer. In college, I worked for a company which did not have air conditioning in the production area. In the heat of the summer, we came in at 4 a.m. so we could leave at noon before the hot part of the, the day. A limited period of time for a specific reason, sanity. I encourage you to fight the insanity. Encourage your congressman to repeal daylight savings time. Don't change your solar schedule. Use Greenwich Mean Time on your watch. I'm Rick Davis, and thank you for listening. All the education in the world won't help you get ahead in life if you can't express your ideas effectively. Every day, competition for advancement gets tougher and tougher. You need an edge. A Toastmasters Club can give you that edge. A low-cost learning experience for men and women. Toastmasters gives you the confidence to express your ideas to anyone. Get the Toastmasters edge. Welcome back. Thank you, Rick Davis, for that tactfully delivered editorial about daylight savings time. I never really gave it much thought. That daylight savings time, I always thought, was created during those energy crises that we had decades ago. And that maybe it's time to just do away with daylight savings time. Interesting thought. May have to ask my congressman about that. <laughs> We have a change to the program. This rarely happens when we get a write-in during the meeting of someone who says, yes, I will fill an empty slot and give a prepared speech. That person you met earlier is Dalip Kamath. And Dalip is going to give us a speech from the Competent Communication Manual, project number nine, persuade with power his topic is quality of information. Quality of information, Dilip Kama. Thank you, Rick. I have to be tactful 
here because uh, this is a last minute speech. I have not prepared for it though it says it is a prepared speech. But I am going to talk about quality of information. Everyone today knows how much of data that is coming into their homes, their business and it is unprecedented. In a collective history, in our collective memory, we have never seen this much of information come into you ever. Look at the number of news outlets, look at internet, your mobile devices, your Blackberries, your iPads, there is information everywhere. Have you ever checked some of your friends status updates? Some of them make six status updates a day. What is that about? And look at the amount of information that is coming into you and you have to make decisions because if you miss a nugget of information in 15 minutes, you are already late. Your investments, your life decisions, the places your children go to school, the information about their teachers, information about your co-workers, about business in general, politics, sports, everything at random pace. The velocity is unbelievable. And this is the reason why quality of information is critical. Otherwise, it is going to be junk in and junk out. This is the reason that we all have to look at the information that we are collecting, the information we are filtering, and the information that we are making decisions on. One small mistake, you are going to be back five to ten years. And I'm very serious about this. Wrong investments because a friend told you that this is a good investment to make and you have not collected enough information and relied on the quality of information can be a financial disaster. Looking up three different Google websites about your symptoms that might be just be a regular cold and thinking that you have malaria and some other critical diseases is disastrous. It is going to play havoc on your psyche if you, if you don't rely on the quality and the judgment of information that you are collecting and making on them. This is the reason why quality of information is so important. If you are driving on the road, there are several different examples. Some of them that can alert you to what is going to happen next, help you make decisions, sometimes can be thought provoking saying why did we collect this information sooner or better. Let me give you an example. If you are driving on a highway and it says 70 miles an hour, the speed limit, I get it. I shouldn't be driving and if I don't see a Sharif's car, I can do a 75, I can do a 79, the plus or minus 10 rule. What about if the signboard also says that if you are between 30 and 45, 90 percent of the people never drive beyond 72. What would you do then? What would you do if a signboard said, if you are 37 and if you drive at 75, 60 percent of the people have had accidents? The quality of information now is helping you make decisions. If you are driving a Toyota Camry, you have always gotten tickets on this road if you have driven at 75. And if you are driving a Toyota Camry, trust me, your feet is on the brake already. That's the quality of information. There are several dimensions of quality. Accuracy is one. Remember you walk into a business meeting and there are 10 executives sitting and saying, looking at the reports and saying, does this look right? Shouldn't we be making decisions on information rather than asking if this is right? What does that tell you? Quality of information. What about you go to a genealogy website like Ancestry.com or FamilySearch.com and realize you can't find any of your ancestors after three levels? What's the reason? Quality of information. Somebody scribbled the name of my great-grandfather. Nobody can read it. Accuracy. The next is consistency. 
If you are at a bus stop and you ask, what time is it? And somebody says 8.30, and you turn around and say, what time is it? And somebody says 8.40, doesn't that make you mad? There's no consistency here. Reliability. You call your, you call your uh, children and say, hey, what time are you going to be home? Mom, Dad, I'm going to be home in about 20 minutes. Guess what? The 20 minutes is almost two hours. So what's the reliability of that information? Important, important dimensions of uh, quality. And today we are talking about, if you're in the business, there's a concept of big data. I mean, we haven't even managed little data yet. And there's already a talk about big data. The velocity, the variety, and the volume of data that is coming into our lives is just unimaginable. So in summary, when you are collecting information, when you are synthesizing information, when you are sharing information, keep that in mind. The quality of data, the quality of information is very, very important. What you do today, how you collect, how you filter, how you share, can change your lives as well as others. So it's very important to keep several dimensions of quality in mind before you take the next step in collecting and managing information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dalip. We'll take one minute for Dalip's evaluator to complete their evaluation. Thank you very much. And now for our next speaker, Stanley Glitchner. Speaking in public doesn't have to be a death sentence. At Toastmasters, we can help you overcome your fears. Welcome back. Thank you, Dalip, for that wonderful speech about the quality of information. It is true that we are just overwhelmed today with information and great advice on how to keep that into perspective and make the best use out of the information that we receive. We now transition into the evaluation portion of our meeting. And for this portion, I have a co-leader who helps with his team in providing the evaluation content, and that is our general evaluator. And today's general evaluator is our club president, Rick Davis. Thank you, Rick. Mr. Toastmaster, first up is uh, the evaluation of Patty's speech, and evaluating Patty's speech will be Rick Barron. <laughs> Small group today. Yes, thank you, Rick. <laughs> the icebreaker, Patty, is probably the most difficult speech that you'll have to give. You have to come up here and do something in theory that you've never done before. Not only in front of an audience, but in front of the cameras and the lights and everything else here at TV Toastmasters. And I'd have to say that was one of the most emotionally touching icebreakers I have ever experienced. You really pulled us in, grabbed us by the heart. I think there was a few uh, tears in the audience there. Very, very good uh, way that you were able to connect with us. And you did that by using things that in most cases are advanced techniques. The first thing that you did is you you pulled us in by relating something from your life to something that we could experience, and that was this concept of, have you ever been called stupid? I think virtually everybody has had some kind of experience like that and could relate to what you were saying. In addition, you use great eye contact with the audience, you know, making your points to specific people in the audience, good eye contact, your notes were here, but they were not a big part of your speech. 
You glanced down occasionally to kind of see where you were, but really just told the story from the heart. It wasn't a memorized speech where you sat here and just read from the notes. Again, a very advanced technique. You used some vocal variety in your speech. You talked about you know, the fire work lit up inside me and you, you know, use some, uh, raise your voice during that portion of the speech. Again, the vocal variety is a good, good thing that um, will come later, something that will come later. One area where I think where you could have brought some more emotion to the speech is in using more of that vocal variety. Really thinking about the emotional content that you were delivering and pausing when you made a real emotional point. You know, maybe when talking about the boy in the neighborhood at the mailbox, raising your voice a little bit sometimes, speaking a little bit faster sometimes. Those are all techniques, I think, that would put that lock around our hearts even more and make it that much more impactful. Overall, the speech was probably one of the best icebreaker speeches I've seen. I'm, I'm waiting to hear for the gram grammarian and the awe counter, but typically those, the, those speeches are ahs and ums and I don't knows and so's. I didn't hear any of that, and I'm waiting to hear what the grammarian and the awe counter came back with as well. Congratulations on delivering the hardest speech you've ever had to deliver and doing it almost flawlessly. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. I think the advanced Toastmasters in the group will agree with me that one of the more fun speeches to listen to is an icebreaker because you get to know the person. They almost become a member of the club after that. You know more about the person and what, what drives them. Evaluating my speech, a person wearing many hats today, Paul Wessels. Rick, thank you. Stop the insanity. This isn't an infomercial. This is a speech by uh, Rick Davis. I'm going to evaluate that. The purpose of this speech is it's an editorial. It's designed for the camera. So an editorial designed for the camera. You want to be able to present the news event or the topic or whatever the editorial is going to be on very clearly and you want to present your reaction to that very clearly with the eye on being on television. So that's the purpose. Obviously what was the event or news or subject matter? It was daylight savings time, something we can all relate to. We're actually pretty close to a, a time zone change here. I, I travel a little bit in Kentucky, Ohio and Indiana and I'm always going over into Kentucky, Western Kentucky, and Indiana at one point, but uh, just a few years ago, never changed. Uh, they were on the same time frame year round. So I personally can relate to what Rick was saying, and it is kind of insane knowing you're so close, who's where, and it is confusing. So I think the title, Stop the Insanity, uh, was very appropriate in, in this uh, speech. So daylight saving time. All, something we can always relate to. What kind of reaction was Rick trying to convey? Well, you know, uh, uh, one word that uh, came across was scam. He says, you know, changing of clocks are, are a scam. So he's trying to convey uh, negatively on the fact that we have to go ahead, in, in my opinion, it was a, a negative response to uh, changing time and uh, daylight savings time. So that came across him across him, in my opinion, very clearly. Did the speaker sound logic? Yes, he, he sound logical. He was very tactful uh, in what he, what he said. He used San, studies from San Jose, other studies, to prove the negative side of daylight savings time, uh, how it affects basically the human body, your cycles and your sleeping and whatnot. So he, it was very logical, gave good proof. Words. He used some great words, like I mentioned before, scam. So he used uh, nice short words that conveyed his opinion, which I think came across real, real well. Relate convincingly to the camera. 
good eye contact. Rick always says good eye contact, uh, good gestures. How would it come across with respect to a camera? The only thing that I thought maybe a little improvement was the map. I knew he had a lot going on here. I liked the way he was seated because it, it's almost presidential or, uh, <laughs> or you know, I'm going to tell you I'm an authoritarian uh, from the seating aspect. But the map, maybe it could have been pulled up with a little bit larger map. It, it was a minor problem, I thought, because it really wasn't the gist of the whole thing, showing the map, just basically giving some sort of proof that, yes, there's a lot of places in this world where they don't uh, have daylight savings time. So in all, I thought it was great. Uh, the favorite part uh, to me was it was actually relevant. It's something relevant, something we deal with here every day, or every day, all the time, uh, going back and forth with daylight savings. And I thought it was a great talk and very relevant, uh, very convincing. And I thought overall it would look, uh, we can see the proof here, uh, good on television. Thank you, Paul. To evaluate Dilip's speech, which we thank him again for, for stepping in at the last minute, Michelle Lewis. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. Fellow Toastmasters, and especially Dilip, you did impromptu speaking again today. And I hope someday I have the courage to actually say halfway through a meeting, I'm going to give up and give a speech. Might be a while. But Dalip gave a speech today, project number nine, power to, or persuade with power. And his objectives were to persuade listeners to adopt his viewpoints or ideas and to take some action, to appeal to the audience interest, to use logic and emotion to support his position, and to avoid using notes. Well, you definitely avoided using notes because you didn't have any notes. <laughs> so a few things that I really like about Dilip's speech is that he used a very relative subject. Anybody and everybody in this room, in the studio audience, on camera, at home, can relate to the quality of information and how important that role plays in our lives. He gave us a number of great examples, whether it's sports, politics, children, you name it. We all have to question the quality of information in this day and age. He had fantastic body language very relaxed, confident in the speech he was giving, fantastic use of vocal variety and pitch, and throughout his speech he emphasized, he kept going back and saying quality of information, so he kept emphasizing throughout the speech what he was referring to and made us all think, yeah, the quality of information is really important. I really liked your three dimensions of information gave us three solid takeaways, the accuracy, the consistency, and the reliability. So that gives us three pieces of information to, to kind of scroll through when we're really wondering if the information we have is truly, is, is quality. So I, I really like the three takeaways. As far as the areas of improvement, struggled in this area, but I think maybe your opening could have been a little bit spiced up. However, you were, you were thrown up here impromptu and you kind of used that to open and kind of joked, well, here I am, I'm going to gonna just get up here and tactfully give you this speech. So, and then your closing. I think your closing, you kind of led on a little bit. You could have just stopped. You said quality of information is very, very important. It can change your life. And I think you could have stopped there. You kind of went on to explain a little bit more. And I think sometimes short and sweet is a little bit better. You also incorporated humor throughout the speech. Love the, the self-diagnosis because I think we've all done that. We've all got into Google and before you know it, we're going to have to have our leg taken off tomorrow because <laughs> we got a mosquito bite, right? So great examples throughout the speech. No notes, very relaxed, and look forward to hearing your next speech. Thank you, Dilip. The next role is grammarian. Do you have your, are you ready to Thank do you. the grammarian? So the next role is Grammarian, and Michelle Lewis is our Grammarian for today, so. Right. Thank you. <laughs> grammarian role today was very challenging for me. I found myself getting involved in the speeches and then evaluating, and all of a sudden I said, oh, I hope I was keeping track of everything. So maybe on the light side, but overall we had very few grammatical areas throughout, this, throughout the meeting today. Rick Davis 
you use a uh, once. I don't think you used the word of the day at all. Okay. Paul, you used the word of the day twice. You had one a, uh, you had an and and, a so, and a you know. Patty, no grammatical errors that I pulled out of your speech and you used the word of the day, which is very challenging for an icebreaker speech, so great job on that. Carol, you had an I, I. Rick Barron, I did not get any grammatical error, errors and I got word of the day twice. I did not track myself, but I'm sure there were some in there. The leap, I had a word of the day once and an um. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. The next part of the meeting is the timers report, and I don't think I've ever seen this person do timing. She does a lot of things in the club, but she uh, doesn't gravitate towards timing. Carol, Carol Carmelin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator, fellow Toastmasters, and our unseen guest in the office, in the studio, and our unseen guest at home. I like the job of timing. Now, I don't know if this is tactful to tell you. I like it because it's a powerful, it's a powerful role. You get to tell people when to hush <laughs> up and get off the stage. So I like being timer. <laughs> Our president took one minute to welcome everyone. I designed this timing guideline. I'm looking all over trying to find it. I'm going to redesign it so it's easier to, to see. <laughs> so it was good that I, I am timer today. Word power, Michelle, when you gave the word, it was for 58 seconds, and when you gave the report, it was 59 seconds. And I will try to make this report tactful, even though it wasn't tactful when I started. The table topics, delete, for your man-made invention, the paper clip, that was very good, one minute and 49 seconds, and Michelle, one minute and 18 seconds, and for myself, two minutes and two seconds. The scheduled speakers, Patty for her icebreaker of four to six minutes, four minutes and 40 seconds, perfect. Rick Davis for your three minute editorial, which is plus or minus 30 seconds. You went a little bit over, you would have been chopped off if they're doing the timing on the studio, it was three minutes and 40 seconds. And Dalip for your impromptu speech, fantastic, off the cuff, and you made it sound like you'd rehearsed this already, six minutes and 35 seconds. The Toastmaster took five minutes to introduce everyone and introduce his comments after each one. That was about five minutes total. For the evaluators, Rick for Patty, three minutes and 26 seconds. Paul for Rick Barron, I mean Rick Davis, got the wrong initial here, Rick Davis, three minutes and 28 seconds, and Michelle for Dalip, three minutes and five seconds. We did very well with the timing today, and Rick, as your general evaluator, you've taken about one minute so far in introducing everyone. Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you, Carol. As a general evaluator, I think we had a great meeting. We've started relatively close to on time. That's always hard with this group because we're always doing some last minute arranging and, and whatnot, but uh, for the most part, I think everything has gone very well today. We had a small group, but an enthusiastic group. That's the, uh, that's the, the key to these things. We could have been a little more, uh, you know, clap happy. That they, they call it clap masters and, and for a reason. So I'd like to bring back our Toastmaster for today, uh, Rick Barron. Thank you, Rick. I agree. It's been a fun meeting today, even though we've had a really small, tight-knit group. And if you're out there in TV land watching us, wondering whether or not you can do this, you can. There's no rocket science to this. All you have to do is show up, and we'd love to have you. You can check us out online at www.tvtoastmasters.com. That's tvtoastmasters.com. You can see the full schedule, the location, everything that you'll need to be able to show up as our guest. Please do. We'd love to have you. And I'll turn the meeting back over to the club president, Rick Davis. Thank you, Rick. With that, I would like to close 
the September 21st meeting of TV Toastmasters, and thank you all.